OK, great. So you can think of this a couple ways. This is a fairly short one, so forwards or backwards probably works here. If we keep our pattern of going backwards, uh, the way I would look at this is you have an ether here. So you're forming an ether. And we generally form ethers through uh, a reaction like this, right? Right, that kind of a substitution to form the ether. That's what we talked about last week, that Williamson ether synthesis. Normally, this comes from an alcohol uh, where you'd have, you'd, you'd have an alcohol that's then deprotonated. Right. Strong base, generally NaH, so you can get it all deprotonated. Um, there is somewhat of a shortcut here, though, because we know that actually the intermediate step of the borohydride reduction is, in fact, this species, right? So instead of protonating it, we might be able to just go this way. Now, depending on the experimental conditions, because here, this is how we would normally do this reaction, right, is we would react with the sodium borohydride and then work it up with water or acid to get the alcohol and then go deprotonate it again, and so on. So we might be able to do this in what's called a one-pot synthesis, meaning you can do multiple steps without actually stopping the reaction and isolating the product and everything. You just kind of keep dumping in new reagents. This, this would be an experimental concern. Um, it might work, it might not. But on paper, it looks pretty good. All right, yeah? Wait, where? What are you talking about? Uh, like, um, like, uh, okay. So the question was, can we use a Grignard reagent here oh, instead of this? Ah, okay. There you go. Okay. So if yes, if you needed another carbon here, that might be a nice way to do it. Okay. Um, but in this case, we didn't. So yeah. Okay, so now that you're all refreshed and reminded about what we're talking about, let's go into the next part, probably the most important part of the chapter, which is epoxide chemistry. What are epoxides? Anybody know? They're cyclic ethers. Right, it's a three-membered ring a three-membered cyclic ether. And they're, uh, they're fairly useful because it's a strained ring, so it can be opened, but it's not so strained as to not exist or not be stable or, or anything like that. So it's strained enough to be reactive and to be a functional group, but, but also not, stra not so strained that it doesn't exist somewhere. Sorry, that's a lot of negatives. but. Uh, these do exist in a lot of natural products. Yeah. Okay. Can't the epoxide be more than three carbons, but it's it will be an oxide It's not three. Or sorry, two, three members. Um. No. Let me clear. Let's clarify that a little bit. A cyclic ether is a cyclic ether. There's. Two rings, there's two names for the three membered ring um, the oxirane or the epoxide. Larger ones have other names, but they don't fit into the category of uh, epoxides. Yeah, I've never heard of a larger, and the book says this also, I've never heard of one of the larger ones called an epoxide. It can be a cyclic ether, but the larger ones are oxetanes, oxalanes, and oxanes as you go to four, five, and six carbons. We won't talk much about them here. We'll focus on this chemistry. These are found in nature, and they can have up to four R groups coming off. And depending on what those are, it can change the chemistry a bit. You can imagine if there are very big, bulky R groups, it makes it less reactive because it's kind of a protected um, epoxide. If they're smaller, it can be more reactive. 
We learned about how to prepare these. Does anybody remember what, how you make them, what you make them from? Yes, uh, and you starting with what type of a functional group? You start with number one. Yeah. <clears throat> so you prepare these from alkenes, generally. And we should also note the stereochemistry here. As with most three-membered rings, it has to be on the same side. So it, it doesn't matter which side it's on but it's on the same side. Of course, this particular molecule is achiral. But uh, this will become important when we talk about some of the reactions of epoxides shortly. All right, this is prepared using some kind of a peroxy acid, which if you recall, is like a carboxylic acid, but with an extra oxygen. And you can see the mechanism for that formation back in chapter nine. One that's commonly used is this one, which is meta chloro peroxybenzoic acid, or MCPBA. Um, uh, you can also use other peroxy acids, peroxyacetic acid. And the process is as we say, stereospecific, meaning that something in this, remember stereospecific means the, starting the stereochemistry of the starting material determines the stereochemistry of the product. Stereoselective means the actual reaction determines the stereochemistry. In this case, if you have something like this type of alkene, okay. if the R's are cis on the alkene, they'll stay cis or they'll stay in whatever relation they are to each other in the um, epoxide. Okay. So you basically retain the, sta the same stereochemical relationships. Whatever's on the same side stays on the same side in the epoxide. And there is one other way to prepare it, which is less important, but we should mention it. You can also make these from halohydrins, which if you recall is a when you have something like an alkene reacting with a halogen in the presence of water, you make something like this. That's known as a halohydrin. Of course, you also make the enantiomer here. And then in treatment with base, you can actually deprotonate the alcohol and have it do a substitution reaction. form the epoxide. I guess we don't have to write plus an antimer anymore because that's chiral. No, that's a chiral.
It's an SN2 type process. So now we know how to make them. Let's talk about how to use them. Or actually, sorry, one more thing. This is actually um, very useful. Let's talk about one of the only um, times in this year that we're ever going to talk about an antioselective reactions is an antioselective. Oxidation. Kind of a mouthful. Now you'll notice that if you think back, any reaction we do, even if there's stereochemistry to it, it's generally stereospecific, um, or in some cases stereoselective, but where the product is a mixture of an antimer. So if you think about bromination of an alkene, that process is stereoselective because you make only the antiproduct. But you make both antiproducts, right? You make both an antimers. You can't select which side of the double bond it's going to go on. And that's true for any of the reactions that we've talked about. When you start with a symmetric achiral reactant or starting material, you can't then choose whether you want the R or the S in your product. You get actually both because it's flat. Here's an example of where they found a way to actually be able to figure that out, to, to control that. All right. So let's, let's take a look at this. Um, the book kind of goes through the history of, of what this is and, and why it doesn't work normally. I'm just going to kind of show the, uh, the results of that. So we're going to look at, specifically here, allylic alcohols. Allylic, if you recall, means one away from a double bond. If it's right on the double bond, it's vinylic. And an allylic alcohol with some very special reagents can be used to actually put the epoxide either on the top or the bottom of the double bond as you like. Okay? So let's look at how this works. What you do is you lay it out in the plane you imagine looking at this kind of on a flat plane so that the alcohol is kind of in the far right hand corner and this is sometimes a little bit tricky to picture but we're going to try to draw it and see so imagine this thing's lying flat in this plane okay and we're going to put the alcohol up here in the upper right hand corner or whatever you want to call that and then the rest of the molecule, the, the rest of the alkene, kind of down in the center of the plane. Okay. And then so we have the proper stereochemistry here. Let's just fill this thing with some R's. So this will be general for, for whatever happens. So we'll have R1, R2, and R3. All right. Now, there are two ways that this thing can be epoxidated, or however you want to talk about that. Epoxidized, epoxidated, I guess. Let's imagine epoxidation on the top. Okay? If you have epoxidation on the top, we're going to draw this in the same sort of configuration. Can you guys kind of picture that? The oxygen is coming out on top, and then let me redraw this a little bit clearer. And everything's been kind of pushed down from flat, so that the epoxide's on top and everything else is pushed kind of downward. <coughs> See that? All right, let's draw the opposite one as well. So 
This one's probably a little bit trickier. So here's our bond. And then we've got R1 kind of up into the left here. And the alcohol out this way. Okay. And then we've got R2 up here. And R3 up there. and the epoxide down below. If this is uh, looking really confusing or unclear to you, if you're not sure where these angles or these bonds come from, I would encourage you to get out your model kit and play with it that way so you can kind of see how that comes from below or from above. Okay, now these are the two enantiomers that through normal epoxidation, you would form. Um, and you would form in a racemic way. If you did MCPBA or whatever, you would get a mixture of these two that we could express accordingly. But by using this other procedure, you can actually select which one you want. And the reagents to do that are a, a tert butyl peroxide, so tert butyl hydro, hydro peroxide. Uh, both, actually. Along with uh, titanium tetraisopropoxide, which is just. Um, titanium with four isopropoxide groups. <clears throat> Looks like this. So those are the same for both of them. And then you have uh, what I guess we could call a chiral auxiliary or a chiral thing that you add in uh, of diethyl tartrate. So let's look at diethyl tartrate. It's the, ethyl, the diethyl ester of tartaric acid. And there are two stereoisomers. This is the dextrorotatory, dextrorotatory one. And the one on the dashes is the levorotatory one, the minus one. The one where one's dash, one wedge is a meso compound and is achiral. So if you use. Uh, I got this right. If you use the plus one with those other two reagents, you get only that top product. And if you use the minus one, you get only the bottom product. So you actually get an an end an antimerically pure uh, epoxide. This is known as asymmetric epoxidation, meaning you can pick one versus the other. It's not symmetric. Um, and this actually won the inventors the Nobel Prize a few years back because it's so incredibly useful. And the, it may not be obvious to you, but the utility of this, as we'll talk about in a little while, is you can make alcohols readily from epoxides while preserving stereochemistry. And we know that alcohols are one of the most important building blocks in all of uh, organic synthesis. So to be able to actually control which enantiomer, which stereochemistry of your alcohol you get is very, very powerful. And that's what's happening here. OK. So let's try, let's look at how we might do this. In a problem way. So what you might see is something like this. We 
we should be specific here because if we say COOH, sometimes we assume that that's a carboxylic acid. So that's your, uh, that's your peroxide that actually does the epoxidation. And then the titanium catalyst that you'll look at here is an OCH. That's the isopropoxide, and there's four of those. Okay. And we want to figure out what product we're going to make with the plus DET. So to do this, what you have to do, at least at first, you'll probably get to the point where you can kind of do this in your head. But to figure this out, lay this on its side oriented in the proper way. Okay? So it has to be in exactly this configuration for this shortcut to work of what goes on the top and what goes on the bottom. So we're going to do that. Draw your plane. Okay. Put your OH up here and draw it exactly in the same arrangement as it is there. All right. And then we have to decide, OK, is the epoxide going to go up on the top, go, up, go in from the top or from the bottom? Top, because we're using the plus and antimer of the diethyl tartrate. So that means that our product, and we can draw it first kind of in the same format just to get a good sense of what it looks like. The epoxide's going to be up here, and that means the other two things are sort of pointing down in the back. But that's really not an appropriate way to finally write uh, the three-dimensional compound because it's not really clear. So really, we should convert this into our normal dash wedge notation. If we think about looking at it from the right, so kind of from this side, what's coming out at you? The alcohol, the allylic alcohol, or that methyl group? The alcohol. So if you're, seeing, if you're looking at it from this side, the alcohol is coming out at you and the methyl is going back, which means the way that we should draw this is like this. Right. So the al alcohol part is coming out at you, and then the methyl group is going to the back. And so we've, found, we've made only this an antimer. Yes? How did you decide about the first side? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter. You could look at it from the left also. In that case, both of the substituents would be over on the left, and then the methyl group would be coming out at you. So you could, also, you could have also drawn this like this. That's also the same thing. Either way you look at it, I don't care. But just draw it in the standard flat way. It would also be appropriate to draw it like this with the epoxide. And one of these would have to go back there. Is there any preference for no. It mostly depends on what you're doing with it later, how you want to express it later. Those are all the same thing. They're all fine ways to express this. As long as you're using dash wedge notation in a, in a way that makes sense, that's fine. And this is from the positive the textual. Right. So let's try another one uh, with the other one, see what you get here. See if you can do this one. So when we form these, is it uh, uh, when we are preparing these, basically we use an equation? Yeah. So is there an easy difference if you made extra or you made vivo or something like that? 
Is there what kind of difference? The yield difference, the uh, preference by the no, you should be able to get pretty good yields of either an antimer that you want using one or the other. Um, so to shorten up these, you may see something like this, but the, the short name for all of this, the guy it was named after, the Sharpless Asymmetric Epoxidation. So you may see those conditions, but you may also just see that somebody might write Sharpless with minus DET. And that's what they're talking about. So you still do the same procedure. Now we're looking at the minus one. Uh, so see what you can do with that. Okay. Now you'll notice these last couple examples have been a little bit easier because, you know, kind of on purpose because we're just starting this, where the alcohol is already sort of in the right position. So all you have to do is kind of rotate it a little bit um, and, and we're good to go. If that's the case, then it's very easy to just say, well, it's a minus one, so we put the epoxide on the dashes. Done. All right. That's not always going to be the case. So this one, we can say it's. It's in the right spot. So always start like that if you're going to do this plain thing. Start with the allylic alcohol part there. Never mind what else is connected, however else it's connected. Start with this right like that. All right? And then we'll draw in the rest of it. Okay. So in this case, You have something like that, right? Which means that if we have the minus DET, the epoxide is going to come in from the bottom, pushing those things up. So our final product will be the epoxide underneath with the allylic alcohol up here, the hydrogen on the other side. Okay, there's a few more examples in your book, so take a look at that um, if that's not clear to you. But now we're going to talk about what happens when you open up the epoxides, and we'll come back to this as a way to make the epoxides that we want to make. All right. We can open the rings in a couple ways. It's always a nucleophilic thing, so an epoxide is an electrophile. We're going to talk first about strong nucleophiles, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the acidic conditions and some other issues. But the most straightforward one is the strong nucleophiles. Strong nucleophiles can open an epoxide in a SN2 type process. So you have your epoxide, you have a nucleophile like hydroxide, it attacks the carbon, and the leaving group is the epoxide opening up, so the oxygen. And that gets you to this, which you could then protonate. So nothing, nothing fancy here, nothing tricky, just opens it up. Okay. And that's going to be the case for any number of strong alcohols that you know about, pretty much anything negatively charged. So there's a whole list of them in the book, um, alkoxide, cyanide, uh, thiols, um, <clears throat> Grignard reagents, and lithium aluminum hydride as well. 
We're going to go through some of these examples as we also talk about the regioselectivity and the stereospecificity of the reaction. So first of all, regiochemistry. Where does the nucleophile go if the epoxide is not um, symmetric? So let's say we react this with, um, how about sodium cyanide followed by water. There are two possible products here. Either the cyanide can attack over here on the left, and we end up with that, or the cyanide can attack on the right, and we end up with that. Which product do you think is favored and why? Um, the bottom one is correct, but your reason is not quite right. The reason being, so it's a, it's a good thought that the alcohol being on the more substituted one to end. Uh, however, that would be kind of a, like a thermodynamic consideration, meaning that there was equilibrium here, and it's more of a kinetic consideration. Let's, let's think of it that way. So what's another reason that that might happen? It's because the, um, the... C, the CN, uh, the nitrogen, uh, uh, the, the C triple cyanide, yeah. will uh, more likely uh, attack Is it the, the, the secondary? Or? Right. It, so, so the, the um, right answer in this case, or the reason that this works this way, is because of steric hindrance, specifically. So the, the cyanide will attack the less hindered spot because it's faster. So that's the, sort of the kinetic um, argument there. But let's be very specific here because we're going to find ways later that it'll actually go the other way. Only strong nucleophiles, so strong nucleophiles are bases, So strong nucleophiles will tend to attack the less hindered side of the epoxide. Let's look at another example here. All right, knowing that then, draw the product of this reaction. Okay, to do this one, you should see that the strongly basic Grignard, which we know kind of acts like a, an anion, will attack here, the less hindered side, and then it'll be protonated. And you end up with something like that, right? Any questions about that? Yeah, we didn't specify it in this case, um, but now we will. So the next part of that then is the stereochemistry. Let's do the same reaction, but specify some stereochemistry on our epoxide. And see if, I'm not going to tell you, but see if you can figure this out. So 
So draw the same, draw the product of that same reaction, but specify the stereochemistry as well, and try to figure out what, what would happen. All right, so let's look at this. As I said, you can think of an SN2 mechanism, and remember, the SN2 reaction itself is only really happening on one carbon. So the, the stereochemistry of the other carbon is not actually going to be affected here. We'll draw the same mechanism. And we see an SN2 reaction happening on that lower carbon, right? So that means that the upper carbon, the other side of the epoxide, is unaffected in this reaction. While the lower carbon undergoes inversion, so the hydrogen gets pushed up, and the phenyl then would come in from the back because it has to come in opposite of the leaving group. So you would end up with hydrogen here, phenyl here. And this is going to be the case for all epoxide openings. So think about it mechanistically. You don't have to think of any special rules. It's just think about it as substitution. All right. So now let's get a little bit trickier. Ring, o ring openings can be done in, with strong bases, but they can also be done in the presence of acid. So this would be an acid. Acid catalyzed ring opening. And this is done in the presence of acid, HX. And the product looks remarkably similar. Maybe not remarkably, looks similar. It's the same. Okay. But the mechanism's a little bit different, and that's going to have some repercussions for uh, the regiochemistry. So let's take a look at that. In this case, we will protonate first. Remember, we said a little while ago, when you're an acid, you can always assume the first step is something gets protonated, and that's true here. And then the X minus, which is probably not as good of a nucleophile or as strong of, of a base as in the other examples, can open it up. Sorry, I drew that bond a little long. I don't know why. So the key in acid, of course, is to use more neutral or weaker nucleophiles, because if you used any kind of strong nucleophile like a Grignard, it would just deprotonate the acid. You can't have those types of things in acid. So reactions of this sort tend to look like this. You might have um, sulfuric acid in water. What's the nucleophile in this case? Well, the epoxide is the electrophile, but the nucleophile is going to be the water. Water is the nucleophile here. So nucle the water, the sulfuric acid protonates the epoxide, water attacks, and the ultimate product is the diol. Another example. In basic conditions, we might be able to react with an alkoxide, like methoxide or ethoxide. In acidic conditions, we can't. So we might in instead react with um, methanol 
in the presence of acid, maybe sulfuric acid again. And now the methanol is the nucleophile. So we'd end up with the methoxy product. So the overall reaction in acid is the same as in base. Different mechanism, the products, the result is the same. But because of the different mechanism, you have to choose a different nucleophile. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, generally you don't. <laughs> um, acidic openings are, are less favorable than the basic openings. But they do allow you to be a little bit, to, be, uh, to access a different product based on selectivity. So here's the interesting thing about acidic mechanisms. Uh, we'll compare them to the base. So here's the basic mechanism we saw before. We're going to use a, an asymmetric epoxide. Let's say we use sodium methoxide. Okay. We use sodium methoxide. The methoxide attacks less substituted side, as we just talked about, and you end up with a product like this. Yeah? Now look at this reaction in acid. So instead of sodium methoxide now, we use methanol as the nucleophile in the presence of acid. And now we actually get a very different product. You'll notice here that this product shows the opposite regioselectivity. And the nucleophile went to the more substituted side instead of the less substituted side. So what do you think is going on there? Why do you think that's happening? What is it about being an acid, about the acidic mechanism, that might change and not select for the steric effect anymore? Yeah, th this mechanism might look a little bit more like SN1. And in fact, I'm not going to go all the way there, because it's not, in fact, an SN1 mechanism. All right. However, it is like eh, an SN1 mechanism, or it has some SN1-like characteristics. Let's look at this. So if we have uh, this, the first step is going to be that protonation. Okay, now in an SN1 mechanism, that OH would actually detach from the left side, leaving a tertiary carbocation. What actually happens is kind of a uh, transition state or an intermediate, uh, well, okay, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is that thing, that molecule, that species, is no longer a symmetric epoxide. It's actually moved over to the side a little bit to look something like this. Well, yeah, I guess I'm using that word in a different context now. Um, it's Yes, it's on the top, but I'm saying it moved over to the right a little bit more rather than being in the middle between the two carbons. So it's not totally detached, but I guess what we might say now is that um, it's sort of partially detached. So 
effectively. Something's not right in this drawing here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So effectively, what you've done is put a partial positive charge on the carbon and the oxygen. Sort of like they're sharing that charge. And because of that, the nucleophile is directed to that partial positive site. Okay. But here's, here's another important point on that. This is still SN2. So even though it's moved over a little bit and it's changed the regiochemistry, it has not actually become SN1. Why is that important? <clears throat> That's right. Uh, and then in the final step here, that methanol would be um, deprotonated by whatever. So we'll just say some base. So another solvent molecule or another starting material or whatever, some base. We don't specify it because we don't actually know in solution what exactly is deprotonating that. And yeah, so the reason that it's important that this is still SM2 is because the stereochemical considerations we talked about before <coughs> stay the same in acid. So you'll still have inversion of configuration uh, on that carbon. The other carbon still keeps the same stereochemistry. You don't screw that up at all by going uh, through this mechanism. OK. Now, one other thing that we should note. Okay. Let's see how I want to. So the regiochemistry is only affected in this way when there is a tertiary carbon. Okay. If if you have an epoxide like this, <clears throat> so here is a, whoops, This is a secondary primary, because we don't count the bond to the epoxide. There's not a big enough difference in electronic stability between the secondary and the tertiary to have that effect. So you won't see that oxygen start to pull away when it's just between the primary and the secondary. And in that case, you'll, the steric factor will still be more important. You'll get that kind of a reaction, that kind of a product. And this is always going to be um, an issue back and forth. So you, it's not, it's not worthwhile, I don't think, to memorize rules of when this happens or when this happens. It's better to look at the mechanisms and look at the molecules. For instance, if you had a molecule that was extremely hindered, had some very large bulky groups on it, there's a good chance that you would never get that sort of reverse selectivity we talked about, even if it were a, a tertiary center, just because there's not enough room for the nucleophile to get up in there. So look at the molecule and, and make a decision that way. Maybe. I don't know. It may or may not be clear. Oh, for, for exam purposes, I tend to make it relatively clear. OK, so that's all the new uh, chemistry in this chapter. Let's practice a little bit 
and talk about how these uh, epoxides factor into synthesis. So let's say we wanted to do a problem like this. And actually, we couldn't do that totally perfectly, but plus an antiomer. We want the trans 1, 2 dial at any rate. Okay. The reactions that we've seen so far that make diols, things like dihydroxylation with osmium tetroxide, um, why, won't those, why aren't those a good option here? Remember back to chapter 9 stuff. Does anyone remember back then? Why don't things like dihydroxylation with osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate work for this type of synthesis to make, a di to make this type of a diol? Why, do Why don't they work in this context? Uh, not too bulky. You do have to start out with an alkene, and we could do that, right? We could, we could imagine a synthetic step. But what's the other issue here? All right, got to go back and review that stuff. Uh, those reactions are stereoselective to cis diols. Remember, the, the osmium tetroxide or permanganate kind of comes at the alkene all on one side or the other. And so you don't get the trans selectivity, you get the cis selectivity. If we want a trans diol then, we have to go a different route. And a good route to a trans diol is an epoxide. Remember that an epoxide has to always all be on the same side. And we could either do this in acid or base. It doesn't matter in this case. And that would get us the trans diol, assuming that there's also an enantiomer here. OK. Now to form that epoxide, we need to remember that we can form those easily from alkenes with peroxy acids. And then we can form the alkene through dehydrogenation of the halide or elimination. Yeah. Is this like essentially using some book gives that like a huge chart and that starts from an alkene versus mm -hmm. RCO3H? Yes. Right. So this is a type of RCO3H. Okay with a specific R. You'll see them various ways, but yeah, whenever you see those peroxy acids, that's what you should be thinking of. All right, um, so now we have a little more time. Why don't you try one? Oh, that's what I was going to say. So what, what to look for here, how we know when to use these um, epoxides? A couple things, and as we do more synthetic practice, uh, you'll, you'll see this, but when you are trying to put something next to an alcohol. That's a good clue that there's an epoxide involved. Remember when we said we want to put something on the same carbon as an alcohol? That's when we looked at that coming from Grignard additions to aldehydes or to ketones. Well now, if you want to put something next to the alcohol, that's a good clue that there's going to be an epoxide involved. Because remember, epoxide has those two carbons. You add to one side, and then the other side ends up with an alcohol. Okay, so let's try another one.
try this one out. So this one, you've added some stereochemistry in terms of an anti-selectivity, um, but you can't do that simply from that first step there. So see if you can figure out what's going on here. Give that one a try. Again, you're adding a methyl group next to an alcohol. So the, I'll give you a clue here. There's an epoxide involved, as you might imagine. OK, um, let's, let's look at strategy here. Again, I don't expect you to get all of these until you, know, you get some practice. But what I see when I look at this, remember, we're ignoring the starting material for now. We're working backwards from the product. What I see is, well, we're looking at it to see the differences. But what I see is a methyl group added and added next to an alcohol, right? Or next to a carbon with an alcohol. So that makes me think an epoxide. What's the other clue that an epoxide is involved here? Yeah, well, the stereochemistry, certainly, right? That now you have this trans product that's formed. And you know, that's also good for epoxide selectivity. Um, so maybe, remember there's some trial and error involved here, but maybe we can think of this as coming from this type of epoxide. And what would we open it with? In this case, we wouldn't want methanol because there would be an oxygen left over there. So there's, what's a, yeah, I think a Grignard would be a better choice here so that we only have the carbon and no oxygen there. OK. So now let's continue to work backwards to the alcohol. Uh, an alcohol can't simply close on itself and become an epoxide. What do we make epoxides from? Alkenes. So we'll take that step back as well, using some kind of peroxy acid. Okay. And then, can you make an alkene from an alcohol? Yeah. yeah. How? How would you do that? Yeah, there's there's various ways to do this. Um, you want to turn the alcohol into some kind of a leaving group, and then eliminate it. Yep, that would be another way to do it. Yeah, you could simply dehydrate it with acid and water and heat. OK, and that gives us that synthesis. So give that a try. And that's all we're going to talk about in chapter 13. There's a couple sections at the end dealing with sulfides. Um, we're not going to really focus on those, maybe glance at them. It's nothing that fancy. Special. Yeah, quiz on Wednesday um, on uh, chapter 14 stuff plus everything else from before as, as usual. But it'll focus on chapter 14 stuff.